With that, I want to welcome everybody to this Taproot Foundation event, Accomplish Your 2022 Goals with Support from Skilled Volunteers. We're so excited to connect with each of you during this event and hopefully through our programs following the webinar. So I'm excited to share information about Taproot, our nonprofit, and how uh, our business pro bono programs may be able to help your organizations build capacity to do even more great work in the future. So some quick introductions. I'm gonna go ahead and take myself off of video for now as we get into the, the meat of the presentation. That way you can focus on the great information we have on these slides. So my name is Kimberly Swartz and I'm the Senior Manager of Community Engagement here at Taproot Foundation. Uh, so my job is really making sure that each of you has what you need in order to engage in our program successfully. So I'm looking forward to connecting with each of you Definitely check out my email and linked info here listed on the slide. Um, I'm also joined by my Taproot colleague, Samina Usmani, who will be covering the chat box throughout today's presentation. Um, a few logistics notes, all attendees will be muted throughout today's event, but please, please, please ask questions or make comments in that chat box. Um, Samina will be handling questions throughout. Um, or will direct them to me during uh, the question and answer portion at the end of the webinar. So with that said, definitely continue using that chat box, continue introducing yourself. Uh, we're so excited to hear uh, where in the world all of you are joining us from and learn more about the great missions um, that your organizations are working in. So while you do that, a little bit more about what we do here at Taproot. The Taproot Foundation is a nonprofit who drives social change by leading, mobilizing, and engaging professionals in pro bono service. Since the early 2000s, Taproot's partnered with over 84,000, or excuse, excuse me, 8,400 social change organizations uh, and 24,000 volunteers, totaling 260 million in donated professional services. Um, in addition to Taproot's pro bono programs and the CSR consultancy work that we do with companies, we're leaders of a global pro bono network and are really committed to advancing this movement, the skilled volunteerism ethic we're trying to spread through further research, education, and events. So we're so glad to have you here with us today. Um, and today's during today's event, we're going to be covering topics like what is pro bono? What does business pro bono even mean? Um, what the value of working with skilled volunteers could be for your nonprofit? I'll share some tips and tests for gauging whether or not a specific need your team might be facing is a good fit for working with skilled volunteers. Um, and to help with that, I'm also going to be joined uh, by one of Taproot's nonprofit partners, uh, Braid Mission. Uh, we have a great uh, panelist who will be hopping on later in the presentation um, to talk about their example, working with skilled volunteers and some of the lessons learned uh, from their own experiences. And then um, I'll, I'll walk through really quickly how you can start accessing support through Taproot's free programs. And then, of course, at the end of the event, we'll save a healthy amount of time for question and answer. So as you've heard, we've got a lot to get through. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, get us rolling. So Taproot was founded as a nonprofit in 2001, really with this knowledge that there's a massive resource gap present in the social sector. We have organizations who very well may have the solutions to our world's most pressing social challenges, but they simply don't have the financial means to carry out those missions to their fullest extent. To put this into context, the average U.S. nonprofit reports spending around 8.7% of its total budget on overhead expenses. This is compared to the 20% average traditionally spent by companies to build a strong infrastructure. There's a gulf between what for-profit organizations can spend on internal infrastructure and staff development versus what nonprofits are able to invest. And this ultimately affects our nonprofits' bottom lines, the mission that we are all delivering to community members, which means that social organizations are missing out on staff development or hiring opportunities, or making do without entire departments like marketing, or we're cutting costs by continuing to delay key capacity building investments like CRM upgrades, uh, redesign of the website, developing an HR handbook, really just to name a few. Um, and I'm curious, let me know in the chat if this is resonating with you at all. 
To put it simply, most organizations tackling social problems don't have the full access to the resources, funding, or on staff expertise needed to fully accomplish their vital missions. The lack of ability to invest in ourselves saps our ability to create and build strong and resilient and sustainable organizations. And due to current global crises, charitable organizations are feeling the strain more than ever while being pushed to get really creative in how we bring in support for our missions and then how we execute upon those missions, right? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of comments in the chat definitely resonating some HR projects. Well, we can definitely talk through some of those ideas later on. So keep those coming in. Um, and really, this is this is the area where pro bono and um, Taproot Foundation services can help. So Taproot bridges the nonprofit resource gap through connections with skilled volunteers who provide their tech, their marketing, HR, strategy, finance, data, uh, that rich, deep experience pro bono. During today's webinar, we're specifically addressing how skilled volunteer support from the private sector can apply to nonprofit needs. So before I get into that, I do just want to pause for a second because uh, often when I say the term pro bono, it, it gives people pause because it immediately brings their mind to legal. Uh, but it's really so much more than that. Pro bono means donated professional services benefiting organizations or individuals that somehow work to improve society. So Taproot's programs, our nonprofit, specifically focuses on the area of marketing and communication, IT and technology, human resources and leadership development, strategy, finance, data, and operations. Through a study that we completed with CECP originally in 2015, and then using refreshed data in 2019, Tappert determined that the average value of an hour of pro bono service, an hour of skilled volunteerism, equals around $195. Tappert's average pro bono project takes around 30 hours of volunteer time to complete, which means your nonprofit is looking at a donated services from one project amounting to just under $6,000. So through the webinar today, when we say that pro bono can be a really valuable tool, I truly mean it. <laughs> By infusing the use of pro bono support throughout your departments, you can save money on your bottom line while building capacity and longer term stability. So at this point, you may be wondering, uh, okay, this all sounds great in theory, but how could using pro bono actually play out at my organization? So I, I wanna dive into that and, and get more specific here. Throughout Tappert's years of experience facilitating pro bono projects and creating these connections between nonprofits and skilled volunteers, we've noticed that there are certain qualities that all successful engagement share. And we've taken these qualities and, and turned them into four screening tests that you can use to evaluate everything on your wish list um, to see if it's a good fit to bring in uh, pro bono help, skilled volunteer support. My first test for you is scope. How big is it? How well defined is the project that you're considering? And I wanna highlight two things here. The first is how, um, expansive, what are the outcomes you're looking for? How big are those outcomes? That's not to say that you can't have big projects. I've seen nonprofits get entire websites built pro bono. It means you need to have very well-defined project outcomes for each portion of that big need, right? So how can we break that website design project up into more bite-sized chunks that a volunteer could effectively handle for you. So if you have a need that might be too big or too loosely defined, um, consider getting an expert in the field to actually help you narrow that scope. Um, this happens a lot for projects involving um, expertise or bringing an experience that you might not necessarily have on staff at your organization. For instance, if you're considering creating a marketing strategy 
and you don't have a marketing team at your organization, it can be really tough to figure out what's too big for one volunteer to handle. Is this too big of a scope? Am I trying to ask too much? Um, I would recommend having a consultation call first, and that can help you set the stage for a really well-defined project or series of projects with volunteer. So I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that Taproot pro bono option a little bit later on. So if you have a good size project that's well-defined, you're very specific about what your final outcomes are gonna be, you know what you wanna walk away from the project with, you can go ahead and check off that scope test. So a few examples here of some well-defined projects, just to kind of put some context behind this, would be things like creating a board recruitment strategy, copywriting for an annual appeal, uh, conducting a SWOT analysis, uh, forecasting a budget for the next uh, 12 months, maybe updating or revamping your employee handbook, things that are really specific, have a clear end goal in mind. The next test that I want you each to consider is urgency. So if the need is urgent, meaning very bad things will happen directly as a result of this project not happening or not getting completed on time, then do not use pro bono to fill that need. So here's the worst possible project <laughs> that I could share. Um, someone reaching out to bring in an event planner for your virtual gala the week before it happens. Pro bono is an amazing resource for many reasons. Uh, skilled volunteers are fantastic and can bring so much value to your organization. But one of the things it's not great at is when there is an absolute deadline and it is coming up incredibly quickly. So take that into account when you're thinking through, when you're examining your list and thinking, all right, we may need to bring in a paid con contractor for that instead, or maybe this is something we should tackle in-house and instead we could bring in some in-kind or pro bono or volunteer resources for these projects um, because their deadline isn't until the end of the year. So go ahead, evaluate your wish list with that urgency test in mind, and consider our next test, which is around knowledge transfer. So I would say an example of pro bono that takes very little knowledge transfer would be something like a plumber coming into your organization to fix your sink. That's a very expensive, very highly skilled individual, but they don't need any information about you or your organization in order to go fix your sink, right? <laughs> so that doesn't work with a staff recruitment and retention strategy. You can't just point a volunteer to a computer and say, there's the computer, please create an effective strategy for us. There has to be a good amount of information exchanged before they can complete that work successfully. Photography or video editing is a, a type of work with a volunteer that would fall somewhere in the middle between those two previous examples. You definitely don't need as much detailed knowledge as, um, the, as, as a strategy project might, but your volunteer will still need to understand the essence of what you wanna capture and, and how you wanna tell that story through images or video. So when you look at your list, are you confident that you can and will transfer the required information? What will that look like remotely if that volunteer is not working in an office with you? Are you gonna rely on board members or team members? How is that knowledge transfer gonna play out? And that really brings us to our fourth and final screening test, which is called board and staff readiness. And this is really, addressing the question of, does your organization want this project to happen? Or is it just you that wants this project to happen? This is really, really important to consider because several folks from around your organization may need to be involved in order to make a project a success. If you as an executive director really wanna try crowdfunding, but your marketing director doesn't think it's a priority, that's a red flag. The worst scenario here is if a volunteer comes in, delivers a beautiful outcome for you, hits all of the goals that you laid forth for you, does amazing work, 
And then their work just sits on the shelf because you didn't ensure beforehand that you had uh, buy-in from around your organization to actually implement the results of this pro bono project. So definitely consider this, uh, this screening test really carefully and thoughtfully because you want to make the most of, of the great service that your volunteer is providing to you. So with that in mind, I want to go into addressing what examples or some recommendations of, of what working with skilled volunteers could look like at your nonprofit. So a few examples listed here, and more than a few. I know there's a lot of copy on this slide. Please don't worry about frantically jotting down notes. Uh, we are recording this event and we'll send out the recording uh, to all registrants. Uh, and you'll be able to fast forward, rewind, and, and pause on the slides that you need. So uh, you'll be able to, to look at these at your leisure later on. So I want to leave you with a few specifics um, before we welcome our guest speaker, Rebecca. Um, so one of the most frequently asked items on the registration form for this event was around how can volunteers help with fundraising? How can they help with individual giving? So this is uh, a popular need across the board, not just for this event. So I figured let's focus here, let's, let's list some examples here. So even though fundraising is a really unique need for the nonprofit sector, volunteers from the corporate space, the private sector, do have the ability to help build your nonprofit's capacity to fundraise more successfully by leveraging their IT or their marketing, communications, um, and data skills. So I'll go through each bucket one, um, one at a time, starting with technology. A huge part of fundraising this year will take place virtually, um, just due to the, the ongoing pandemic and health concerns. Not everyone is going to be feel comfortable going to traditionally in-person um, events. And so I would encourage you to think about the IT and the tech and the coding skills that you'll need to leverage in order to attract people to your websites, manage relationships with donors efficiently, and host events that bring in funds. So you'll see some high need pro bono project requests listed here under the tech bucket that you could consider um, uh, leveraging through Taproot. Moving on to data, nonprofits are scrappy. They make the most out of their budgets and their staff availability, which means you need to be certain that you're getting the highest return on investment out of all of your campaigns or programs. And that's really where data and analytics skills can come in. So some of the pro bono opportunities listed here help get a nonprofit to the point where they can effectively track results of their fundraising and then that use that data to refine future efforts. So thinking about things like Google Analytics setup and then training your staff members on how to use analytics going forward, that could be an amazing way to make use of a volunteer skill set. Things like setting uh, KPIs, key performance indicators for your organization to help with your impact measurement. All really, really impactful ways to consider using corporate talent. Moving on to HR, um, nonprofit boards are a massive piece of fundraising success. If nonprofits have the right people in those board positions, you can bring in more donors or program partners. Um, and volunteers HR skills can help you build strategies for board recruitment, help you define board roles, or even set expectations for the resources board members are looked at to bring in. Whether those resources are in kind, uh, like maybe you have a board seat that is responsible for, for bringing in more marketing support. Um, you could also have a board seat that's responsible for really chairing uh, your fundraising efforts and engaging board members in fundraising. So really consider the makeup of your board um, and consider how volunteers can help shake up or define the makeup of your board. Moving on to marketing, bringing in additional marketing expertise is undoubtedly a huge benefit for any nonprofit running a Giving Tuesday, an individual giving campaign throughout the year, anything related to holiday giving, from the communications planning to the graphic design elements to public relations or media outreach, 
copywriting, social media strategy. The list in this area could definitely go on quite long in this bucket. So I definitely um, encourage you to take a look to see um, if any of those volunteer skill sets could be helpful for you and your team going forward. Moving on to finance. Financial management and budgeting is another infrastructure piece that can be really helpful for organizations to have in place when doing large scale fundraising or development efforts. So volunteer experience from the financial sector can assist in some of the frequently requested pro bono that we have listed under this bucket. Things like pricing analysis. Are you offering your services at the right fee? Um, things like business planning or uh, budgeting for the next year, financial forecasting or financial reforecasting if, uh, if your revenue has changed quite a bit over the past couple of years due to the pandemic. And then the last bucket of um, potential volunteer projects I'd call out here is under strategy. Strategy skills are hugely relevant to nonprofits if you approach fundraising campaigns from a business development angle. Business professionals can use their skills to help build pieces like a pitch deck or donor personas. You know, who is the ideal audience member you're trying to go after to bring in funds? Um, they can help create a competitor analysis, and, and much, much more. So definitely consider how you can leverage skills in that area as well. All right, so with all of that said, I'm gonna go ahead and switch things up. I'm gonna bring in a wonderful guest presenter. Her name is Rebecca Edwards. And, oh, yep, I see you're popping onto audio. Rebecca is a longtime Taproot nonprofit partner. Um, she's been a great participant in our programs, namely in our online platform, Taproot Plus, which we'll be um, giving a little bit more information about later on in the presentation. And she's worked with quite a few of our volunteers on a range of projects. I've listed a few here, um, but I'm also going to ask Rebecca to share a little bit more information about them as well. So please join me in welcoming Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so glad to be part of this today. As Kimberly said, at Braid Mission, we have utilized Taproot many times over the last several years. Taproot was recommended to me by an old friend who had run a nonprofit for a long time. And when I was very new in this world, um, just starting to found Braid, um, it was just like a gold mine of a recommendation. So happy to tell you all more about how this has worked for us. Um, one, we, we have done several projects in several different areas. A couple of the ones that have been the most impactful were several years ago, we did a social media strategy project and it was, it really fit almost perfectly into all of those parameters that Kimberly talked about. It was a perfect six week project. It was a bite sized manageable um, undertaking. And we had someone really help us assess our current social media and do some research on what other nonprofits were doing and put together a whole calendar for us of how often we should post on each platform per week, what types of hashtags we should use, um, different strategies for engaging various constituents. And so one thing I would say across the board, regardless of what type of project we've been doing, I've always learned a lot from them. And I've appreciated our, our pro bono volunteers in tackling the specific issue that we're trying to accomplish, but also having a more holistic approach of, you know, how can it be a, a, a larger grounding for our organization and how can our communications in general be stronger? So it always kind of reaches out into other areas. And we continue to use that social media strategy. I think it's been about four years since we did that. We could certainly do a refresh on it, but it had such a good foundation that has, it has really impacted how we've worked. Um, and I should say, I'm I'm reading the chat and seeing that you all, you all are coming 
from all over the place and all different types and sizes of organizations. We are extremely small. It's still our staff is the two of us who founded this organization and a part-time admin who works remotely. So we really don't have bandwidth. Um, we really fit into that like ideal subject for taproot projects. We just don't have a huge staff. So um, something like that that can help us use our limited staff and resource resources better has been perfect for us. Um, we've yeah, also no, no, oh sorry, Rebecca, continue. Uh, no, I the other projects that have been really great. We had when we got a new email system, we had someone work with us on setting up email flows to different like when people join our newsletter. Um, when they make a donation. And another thing across the board with Taproot is we've always, I've just always been awed by the, the skill sets and the experience of our volunteers. The person who helped us set up that email stuff is, um, she had worked for Martha Stewart Living and, you know, like reading wow. the resumes is, it's pretty impressive. Um, so that, is something that we continue to use now. And again, I learned a lot about how I could then tweak things, set things up, think about that strategy. And then the project that has had by far the biggest impact on us was we had pro bono volunteers help us adapt Salesforce for, um, for our use. And you know, you all probably know that Salesforce offers free licensing to nonprofits, but it takes a lot of work to adapt it to nonprofit use because it's it's set up for commerce. Um, this is an example where we we really didn't realize the scope of the project properly sure. when we threw it out there. Interestingly, it was the project where I had the most people apply to be our pro bono volunteer. I think there were six or seven people. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind is that you need to allow some time to interview those people and select the right fit. And we ended up with someone wonderful who was herself. Um, she had a lot of experience in CRM, but not Salesforce specifically. So we were kind of a learning project for her. And that ended up working really well because she really wanted to learn and she did everything she could to get the resources that we needed. Um, she wasn't, and we haven't had any volunteers who were like arrogant or know it all, but she was, I just appreciated that we were learning and she was learning what yeah, she to we Yeah, totally. Um, she, the main benefit for us was that she helped us, like this was such a massive undertaking that um, she helped us walk through this really great process of before we were gonna alter Salesforce, we needed to know what data we were adapting it for. And so we are a volunteer dependent organization. We do mentoring for foster youth. We have about 150 volunteers. Um, in addition to donors and, and other constituents. And so she helped us really walk through step by step, how did volunteers come into our organization and what did we need to capture in that process? And along the way, we made changes not even related to Salesforce that helped us improve that process. So just kind of holistically for our organization, it was very beneficial and it took that process itself took six weeks, mm -hmm. but then we started the building out of Salesforce. And she then called in other volunteers as she was learning, ended up two people working on this. It took the better part of a year, but it was so helpful for us to really have that structure. And now we have this beautiful CRM setup where we have all of that data captured about all of our volunteers, all of our donors. I can't imagine not having that. Yeah. It's just hugely beneficial. Yeah. I mean, CRM systems and just getting your data talking to one another, it's such an important foundational piece. I think that's such an amazing example of what capacity building can look like at a nonprofit organization, investing that time and energy into 
yourself uh, so that you can then do your work and meet your community uh, members' needs um, more efficiently in the future. So thank you so much for sharing that, that background context and a few examples of how you've worked with different volunteers. I saw a lot of interest in both the social media side of things and uh, the Salesforce slash CRM side of things in the chat. So people, that was definitely resonating with folks on the line. Mm -hmm. And I want to jump back to something you mentioned earlier, which I so appreciated you bringing up, which was that you're a small nonprofit team. You need to make the most out of your resources and, and bring in that additional perspective and expertise. And I think um, it, it's all about looking at your list of to-do items and figuring out what are the things that really give me energy? What are the things I'm actually really great at? And those are what you should continue to lean into. And mm -hmm. then those items on the list that maybe drain you, pour you out instead of filling you up, that you have to do that extra, you know, it takes you over the weekend to research, to figure out how to even do an email marketing campaign or how to create those automations. That's where external support can be especially impactful because it allows you to get back to doing the, the items that you're actually really skilled at and really experienced in. Um, so thank you so much for kind of going into that topic. I think that was really um, important. I do wanna have, pose a question for you because I know planning for a, a project with a volunteer can often feel so daunting for nonprofits, um, just that prep work that goes into it, because it is a time investment. You know, pro bono mm -hmm. through Taproot, it is free of cost, but it does take time and energy to plan for effectively. So I'm curious if there's any tactics or tools that have assisted you with this process in the past. Yeah, well, plug for the Taproot website because there really are amazing resources on there. Um, sometimes I go on there and just kind of browse like I'm window shopping and dreaming about <laughs> that you could do. Cause I, I don't necessarily, because there are things that are outside of my skill set. I don't necessarily have specific ideas of types of projects. Sure. Um, but I think, for us, and we haven't done a project in a while, COVID crushed a couple of them. Sure. Um, but I think what resonated for me in your presentation was the knowledge transfer. A lot of our projects have been related to marketing and communications. And those types of projects really involve a lot of knowledge transfer. Um, more so than we've done some more technical ones, like getting other things integrated with Salesforce. That's kind of having a conversation, giving someone login information, checking sure. that periodically. But if it's marketing and communications, there's just so much download about your organization and entrusting that to someone to, you know, work their magic with it. So I only do one project at a time. Like it's easy to make that wish list and have the yeah. long list of things. Oh, I wish we could do all 12 of these things this year. But it does take time to to focus on these things um, and make sure that if it, you know, a six week project that I'm not going on, on vacation in the middle of that. That's sure. not the best timing. So for me, it's just helped to make it more manageable to do one at a time, something that we can really focus on. And again, something that's not urgent. Yeah, I think that's really, really good advice. I think um, often I find myself in conversations with folks who are new to the idea of business pro bono and in-kind resources and working with skilled volunteers at their nonprofits. And they get very excited, which is great. I love the enthusiasm, but they immediately have, all right, I have 10 different things I want to post on your website right now to start recruiting mm -hmm. volunteers for. Mm -hmm. And I, it's it's tough to get them to just pause and take a step back because they don't realize even though it's free to post all those needs and put them out there, there is such a time investment and energy investment when it comes to uh posting those projects or requests, and then interviewing and recruiting the volunteer, which is something you touched on earlier on, you know, giving yourself the time to review the candidates that are coming in. 
and make sure you're getting uh, matched with the right person for your project. Um, and so I think that's such a, a crucial point that you brought up. Yeah, it's definitely a factor in there. And, and along the way, it is a back and forth, even if it's something that's more hands off, like a more technical project. Um, you just need to be available to answer questions, because if your volunteer gets stuck on a step because they need information from you um, mm -hmm. and you're in a short span of time, like six weeks, then that can really bog it down. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And so taking into account your own schedule for project managing over the next uh, couple of weeks, couple of months, depending on how big the project is going to be, is a really good thing to keep in mind. Um, for instance, um, will you be able to commit an hour to reviewing materials or providing feedback to the volunteer each week? Mm -hmm. If you're not able to easily answer that question, then now might not be the right time for you to take on this, uh, this project as the manager of it. Maybe see if anyone else in your organization can pitch in and take ownership instead. It could be a great professional development opportunity for someone who's maybe lower ranking in the organization. Um, mm -hmm. And this could be a great way for them to develop their own management um, uh, and uh, strategy skills, you know, working with an external party. Um, or it could be a great way to engage your board members um, and having them manage these in-kind resources um, as a way to benefit your organization. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm seeing some questions come through that are specific to Taproot. So Rebecca, if you don't mind, I think I'm going to jump us back to really quickly running through Taproot Plus, how to access getting folks started. And then in just a couple of minutes, I want to bring you back for Q&A time because I, I know folks are, are still bringing in questions for you specifically. Okay. Is that OK? Sounds great. All right. Well, thank you so much for what you've shared so far. It's been so insightful. Um, and I know folks in the chat have been chiming in with how helpful it has been to hear. So thanks for that. All right, everyone, I'm going to because I want to make sure we have a chance to get to all of those Taproot specific questions that are coming in. So I want to bounce us back uh, for how you can actually get connected with skilled volunteers through our programs. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in there. We've tried to make things simple and streamlined through our online nonprofit and volunteer matching platform, which is called Taproot Plus. So we designed Tapper Plus to be really flexible and nimble so that any volunteer can get skilled volunteers, no matter how big you are. So there's no budget requirement. There's no staff size requirement. There's no years of operation requirement. We are an openly accessible resource. Um, and any business professional can support said nonprofit no matter where they're located. Um, so Taproot Plus is currently open to registered nonprofits, public schools, and fiscally sponsored social good organizations across the United States, United Kingdom, European Union, Canada, and India. And we have around 100,000 total users. And let me go ahead. I'm going to post a link at the top of the screen now. If you don't have a Taproot Plus account, I encourage you head on over and uh, and go through the steps of creating one because it's completely cost free to use. There's no limit to the number of staff members at your nonprofit who can have an account on Taproot Plus. Uh, so later today when I send out the recording uh, from this event, please feel free to forward the information to a colleague who could also benefit from working with virtual volunteers. Taproot is a nonprofit which exists to assist other nonprofits. So the only cost associated with our programs is the time and energy it will take to request and manage skilled volunteers. So there's no fee. I know I've seen a couple questions come in on that front. There's no fee associated with it at all and no membership um, fee that you have to pay on an ongoing basis. So I'm going to walk through the process super quickly because I want to make sure we leave lots of, of time for question and answer. To get started, all you need to do is pull up a browser and head over to taprootplus.org. And again, you can click that link at the top of your screen um, and it'll take you directly there. And then hit sign up or submit a request to get started. 
you'll have to tell us a few details about the organization you work for. So make sure you have your EIN handy and use an email account that you check regularly. Email is how Taproot staff members are going to tell you, hey, you have a great volunteer applicant waiting for you, or hey, I actually think the scope of your project could use a little tidying up. Here are my recommendations. So make sure it's an email inbox that you're regularly looking at because you don't wanna miss any of those important notifications. Um, and as a reminder, any 501c3 public school program or fiscally sponsored organization is welcome. So once you have your account set up and you've confirmed your email, you're ready to post a request for skilled volunteer support. So you have two main options through Taproot Plus. One of them is a project, which is tackling a more in-depth need, anywhere two to 10 weeks working with a volunteer who's sharing around three to five hours of their time with you each week. So that's one of our core options, the projects. And then the other core option is called a consultation session. So I wanna quickly talk about the consultation session because I mentioned it a little earlier when I was uh, going through our scoping test. And I think this could be really helpful for folks on the line uh, to leverage themselves. So through a consultation session, you can connect with a subject matter expert. So a volunteer expert for a one hour, one time call to talk through a particular need. It's a great option if you're brainstorming and need a fresh perspective, or you just need someone to blue sky, ideate new ideas. Um, it's a great option for sourcing neutral feedback. If you need someone to take a look at a new version of your handbook or a, a page on your website or a presentation deck you're prepping and you need someone just third party perspective with an expert lens, this could be a great, uh, great place to find that support. Um, or it's a good place for quick problem solving. I know um, an area where Tappert's used session support in the past is uh, Salesforce questions. We use Salesforce as a CRM here at Tappert, and we try and practice what we preach and bring in pro bono resources in areas where we do not have staff on on hand um, who are experts at Salesforce. So a great way we can build our own capacity is by asking questions of our really experienced Salesforce volunteers through these sessions. Um, and then I know, I think Samina dropped a link a little bit earlier in the presentation about some uh, a blog with some other session ideas. So I don't know, Samina, if you can reshare that link, I think um, that would be helpful for folks on the line to see. And so then with projects, remember, these are the more in-depth, you're working with a volunteer for a bit of an extended period of time. So this would be something a, a little bit more of a meatier need where you have an idea of that end outcome in mind, um, things like updating HR policies or doing a tech assessment um, or designing social media graphics. Those would all, would all be really great examples of pro bono projects. And definitely check your inbox later today. I'm going to follow up from this event with the recording, but I'll also include a link to a common projects catalog, which hopefully will give you a lot of great inspiration for some other project ideas um, to consider working with virtual volunteers on. Um, and drop a note in the chat if there's a specific project or session that you're considering requesting first. I'm curious, you know, what is what caught people's eye as something that their nonprofit could really benefit from immediately. And while you're doing that, I have a few tips for those of you considering project requests. Um, my first piece of advice is to be really clear and specific with what you want to leave the project having accomplished. This specificity helps volunteer applicants know if they're the right fit for you. Um, once your project request is posted and published on Taproot Plus, our live site, volunteer applicants are going to be scrolling through, trying to find one that really jumps out to them, that they think their skills could be a good match for. Taproot will also help you recruit volunteers. We'll send opportunities to folks in our community via email um, if their skills are the right match, um, encouraging them to apply to work with you. 
So make sure you're really clear and um, specific with what, how you will know that the project was successful. What are those outcomes you're looking for? And then tip number two, show passion and excitement for the work that your volunteer partner is going to be completing. Um, you know, get them excited about the impacts that they're going to be able to create with your organization. These volunteers are largely from the corporate space. And one of the amazing benefits for them in doing pro bono is to get to learn more about your mission, learn about the social issue that you and your team are tackling, and to feel like they're an important piece of that work. So make sure you, you know, sell your mission, sell uh, the excitement behind this project to them. That's a great way to recruit um, really talented applicants to your specific project request. And then my third tip is demonstrate readiness for the work in some way. You know, you could tell your volunteer how you're going to, how you're preparing to implement it. You know, do you have a plan in place? Do you have a staff member assigned who will be working with the volunteer on the project, who will be doing that knowledge transfer and coordinating that on behalf of your volunteer? Sometimes all an applicant needs to know and see is that their work is going to be carried on after they step away from your organization. Um, like I said earlier, when I was going through the, the test for great pro bono, kind of the worst possible situation is if a volunteer has just poured love and generosity and their experience into your organization and has delivered something beautiful for you. And then it sits on a shelf because you didn't have an implementation plan ready. And so that's a really good thing to kind of have thought through, at least initially, um, when you are requesting your volunteer. And then with that, just a few closing thoughts before I open things up for Q&A. If you haven't posted a question in the chat and you're still mulling it over, make sure you get those in because we're gonna jump to open question and answer session shortly. So once your project ask has been submitted, um, Tappert staff members review every single one of those. So this is an online system, but there are still real people uh, like me who sit at Taproot and uh, we make sure that your project requests um, are a good fit for our marketplace. We make sure that the scope is okay, that the description is, is well thought out. And if there's anything that we think could be tightened up or changed, our team will get back to you. We'll reach out to you and work with you one-on-one -on -one to kind of clean that up and get it ready for publishing. So once it's successfully approved and published, it's going to get its own listing page on Tapper Plus, and we'll also share uh, via LinkedIn's volunteer marketplace. Um, and like I mentioned before, we'll email out volunteers in our community um, who we think might be a good match um, and have the right skills uh, to uh, satisfy your needs. Um, and then you're going to see the applications roll in. You'll see the volunteers uh, LinkedIn, their resume. You'll see a uh, statement of interest, which is basically a mini cover letter. Um, and you'll get to evaluate based on that information if you think that volunteer might be a good fit, you'll let Taproot know, and we'll help you set up an interview with that candidate. And depending on how the, uh, that interview goes, then you can select to officially match with that volunteer and move forward with them to complete that project together. All right, with all of that said, I'm gonna go ahead and switch us over to Q&A. So please make sure, get those questions in. Um, and if they're for Rebecca, definitely feel free. She's still on the line, so she can still answer questions um, if you have any remaining thoughts for her as well. So I'm just gonna go ahead and scroll through and organize some thoughts. Um, Amanda, yes, so you can request more than one um, project at a time. You can also bring in more than one volunteer for each project. So for example, if you have a copywriting project listed and it's a big project, you can actually leave that up. You can let us know, I wanna recruit two volunteers to handle this need instead. And then your two copywriting volunteers can actually act as editors for one another. 
So yes, you can recruit multiple volunteers for one project, and you can also have more than one projects recruiting at a time. So hopefully that helps answer things for you. Rebecca, I have a question here for you um, in terms of your social media strategy project. Um, we had a question curious about kind of how are you able to see and then track the results and impact from that project you completed with your volunteer? Yeah, um, that was part of the scoping of the project was that she gave us different ways to look at the metrics, different ways to measure the impact. Um, and the whole thing was tailored toward, I mean, you could spend, you you all know you could have people who work full time on social media strategy. Mm -hmm. um, I told her this is the number of hours we have per week to devote to that. And she tailored our strategy toward that, um, which included how to assess whether the time we were spending on Twitter was worthwhile or not. So I've been able to tailor that over the years, realizing, OK, we're getting less engagement on Facebook now than we used to be. Um, so I'm going to put more energy into Instagram because that's where we're getting more engagement. Yeah, that's so smart. I um I love the in the purposefulness and the intentionality you're putting behind those efforts, and that's why I really advocate for projects that contain some sort of analytics or data piece because that's going to help you continue to optimize that work going forward. Um, so it's not just a one and done project, a volunteer delivered it for you and then walked away, but there's a way for you to maintain it and study it and evaluate it and then tweak it going forward, depending on what's working and what's not working. Yeah, really, absolutely. really good tip. Um, all right. I'm seeing questions fly in fast and furious, so I'm going to try and get to them one at a time. Um, I have one right from Early on, have I seen pro bono for 990 easy tax prepare um, uh, preparation? Yes. So uh, that's a great question. I know we're coming into tax season. I would recommend getting those requests in sooner rather than later um, because our accounting and finance volunteers are, it's, it's going to be a competitive process uh, to match with them as the season continues. Um, but yes, that is something that you can get volunteer support for. Next question here, um, how do you classify pro bono donations from Taproot Foundation on an annual report slash audit? You know, this is <laughs> such, I love this question because it's actually something Samina and I, uh, my colleague who's on the line have, uh, have questioned, should we create a template or a resource for nonprofits on, um, on how to do this? So please drop in the chat if that sort of resource would be helpful for you, because uh, we're, we're curious if, um, if that's something we should work on developing for folks. Um, thanks so much for that feedback, uh, Charlene. Um, but when you we're going to be classified as an in-kind donation. So um, Again, we can follow up with you with more information and, and links on that. Thank you so much for folks who are chiming in. Um, that'll put uh, some fire under <laughs> fire in our bellies for creating more of a guide for doing that. But we are classified as an in-kind resource donation, in-kind resource. Yeah, and Samina just posted in the chat, any other types of resources that will help you, drop that feedback in. We save these chat logs and use them to help shape future events or blogs or resources that we create. So definitely drop ideas in. Um, and I'm going to keep rolling through these questions. Um, so curious as to how Taproot finds volunteers and makes money. <laughs> um, I'm sorry for laughing. That is a good question. Um, so Taproot is a nonprofit. Um, and I'm only laughing because we get this question quite frequently because people hear that our services are free and they're wondering how we even stay in business, right? So it's totally understandable why you ask that. So Taproot's a nonprofit. So we get donations just like other nonprofits do through individuals, through foundation partners, through corporate partners, um, through event sponsors. Um, however, Taproot's a little unique in that we also uh, work with companies um, as a CSR consultancy, and we go into a company and help them evaluate uh, how they could connect their employee engagement programs into social impact goals. 
Um, so we help them build strategies, build programs, and then execute those programs. So build really customized pro bono programming at companies and businesses. So we've worked with over uh, 100 Fortune 500 companies at that at this point. And those uh, consultancy um, uh, partnerships that we're able to enter into help cover the cost of these really open access programs like taprootplus.org, which is totally free, no barriers to entry for individual volunteers or nonprofits. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, can we have a consultation call with Taproot to help identify and narrow the scope of the project? This is something stay tuned on. I'm currently working on uh, piloting some one-on-one -on -one calls with Taproot staff members um, to help you out with this. Um, so stay tuned for a resource along those lines. But in the meantime, I actually think uh, consultation sessions through Taproot Plus on the topic of project management, you can get linked with really knowledgeable project managers. So professional project managers. I've, I've done a session with a project manager before to help kind of lay the groundwork for, I have these really big, far reaching priorities for the next year. How would you recommend that I even approach starting this work? And they're able to offer a really great expertise in that regard. So I definitely recommend project management sessions can be really helpful um, and connect with a volunteer on that. Um, I see a question on recommended minimum maximum number of hours per week a nonprofit can ask of volunteers. Don't be afraid to be specific uh, in your project request on that form. Like I said, it's a customizable form, so you're able to enter in um, whatever information uh, you need to, you feel like uh, tells the story of the project you're hoping to accomplish. And one of those items that you include could be, we need a volunteer who's prepared to share five hours of time per week during this time frame. We That is absolutely what we need. Or you could be more flexible about, you know, we, this is a priority project for our organization, but the timeline um, is flexible. So uh, we're able to work anywhere from two to five hours a week with someone, right? So don't be afraid to be specific in your project request form. I would say on average, um, I see volunteers give around three to five hours of their time per week. And I would say a, ch a weekly check-in around 30 minute check-in with a volunteer each week. So that's definitely a time cost that you should keep in mind. Do you have 30 minutes available for a weekly check-in? Um, do, do, do. do we find that certain types of organizations are more or less likely to have success getting volunteers as a largely member-based nonprofits? We've struggled finding volunteer support in the past. Um, no. I do not find that certain types of organizations um, have better luck than others. Honestly, it comes down to your project request. Have you been really specific with your need? Have you made it clear how you're going to implement the project? Have you sold your volunteer um, or volunteer um, potential applicants on the impact that they're going to be helping you create? Taproot itself, you know, we use pro bono support uh, pretty frequently. I just finished a Taproot Plus project with a research volunteer uh, yesterday. I officially marked it as complete in the system. And we are similar to a membership-based organization ourselves, um, And we're able to find um, a good amount of support from people who are interested in supporting a, a sector instead of just one specific mission. So don't be afraid of putting your request out there. Um, we will work equally hard to find you volunteers um, no matter what your mission is. All right, so I know we're right at two o'clock um, and I think folks have to jump. I'm going to stick around and continue answering questions, uh, but I know that Rebecca um, might have to jump. So I just want to say thank you so much to Rebecca for joining us. Um, your insights were so helpful, and we so appreciate uh, the time um, you took to join us today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I can stick around for a few minutes. Okay, perfect. Definitely, if you have any remaining questions for Rebecca, definitely drop them in. We'll, we'll prioritize those um, to make the most out of her time. Um, actually, I see one uh, from a little earlier on. 
Rebecca, do you have any plans to use pro bono in the next couple of months? What are your next ideas for a project or a session that you're considering? Because I think you mentioned that there was a slowdown due to the pandemic. Yeah, um, I don't have one right on the front burner, um, but I know that, again, you guys send out really great resources for how to think about projects and kind of the catalog of different things to consider. Um, and whenever I look through there, I get really inspired. I think that we might come back around at a couple of projects that didn't pan out for us. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is another, an integration of our donation system with Salesforce. And yeah. then um, our project that just kept getting thwarted by COVID was around digital advertising. Um, so we're starting to work with Google ad grants and we're paying someone to help us with that, but kind of a broader strategy for that might be something that we would tackle in the future. Yeah, that's great. And thank you for, for being comfortable sharing that with us, your future plans. Um, I love that you're thinking about advertising and utilizing that Google ads grant. Um, that is something that you can find volunteer support for. Um, but if it's a high priority for your organization, it could be great to bring in a, a paid contractor for it as well. Um, so good advice. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I see someone just joined. We will send a recording later today, so you won't miss any of the great info. Don't worry. Um, I saw another question come in around the screening process for volunteers that participate with Taproot. So Taproot Foundation, we offer services through Taproot Plus, uh, this online site that you sign up on. Um, and can get virtual volunteers on. But once you create an account on Tapper Plus, you're also eligible for some of our other offerings as well. We do events quite regularly. We host programs with our corporate partners, um, like I was mentioning. And so when an event or opportunity comes available that you're eligible for, we'll, we'll shoot you an email um, and get you um, involved or at least get you the application information so you can get involved. So for those types of events, the screening process for nonprofits and volunteers is handled by Taproot Foundation staff members very thoroughly. Um, so we'll screen and make sure we ensure best fit between the nonprofit participants and the volunteers that we have available. Um, we create customized teams of volunteers to help tackle those nonprofit needs during the course of the event or program. So if you're participating in that Taproot programming, it's very hands-on curated by Taproot staff members. If you are connecting with someone for more on-demand support through Taproot Plus, such as a consultation session or a project, the screening process is really going to be um, up to you as you review the resume and LinkedIn profile and statement of interest of the volunteer candidates that come in um, for you to see, I think this person might be a good fit you'll choose whether you want to move on to the interview phase with that person. And then during the interview, that's when you'll have a chance uh, to really suss out, all right, yes, I can confirm this person has the expertise I need, they have the time available, and they have the working style that I'll be able to work well with over the next two months on this, on this project together. And so treat those interviews like you would uh, if you're interviewing a paid contractor or a paid staff member, you know, take them really seriously to ensure you're finding a good fit. And Rebecca, on that interview note, I wonder if you have any tips to share on kind of the digging you've done or, or how you vetted your volunteer candidates through Taproot Plus to find someone who's been a good fit. Yeah, well, we haven't had multiple volunteers apply for every project we've done. And, but what I would say on that note is that the saying beggars can't be choosers isn't true. If that one person who applies for your project doesn't seem like the right fit, don't use them. Um, you know, I've sometimes talked to people and just thought, okay, they may be, I don't know. It just doesn't, I, I'm a very intuitive person. So that's what it, it tends mm -hmm. to, I rely on. 
Um, but we have also had other situations where the one person who has applied has been fantastic. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's part of general advice too, of this probably isn't going to happen overnight. Sometimes we've had people apply right away. Other times it's taken a while and Taproot can boost your project a little bit sometimes. Um, like one time we were looking for a video project and that had to be local because it was video. And so they boosted it on the Taproot social media. Um, but yeah, I would, as Kimberly said, take time for those interviews, trust your gut and yeah, approach it like, you were hiring them because they're going to be doing something integral to your organization. And you want to make sure that it just sounds like they understand what you're trying to do, that they understand your organization and that they have a, a passion for working on this particular thing. Wow. So true. I, um, I want to frame your words. Uh, like you are not the, the phrase beggars can't be choosers does not apply to you. So if you're a nonprofit on this line, mm -hmm. please that please don't let that be your mentality as you're entering into bringing on skilled volunteers to work with you. It's you are receiving benefits from the volunteer. That's absolutely true. But the volunteer is also receiving benefits from working with you. They're learning about your work. They're learning about a social issue. They're being enriched from this opportunity as well. You could act as a professional reference for them down the road. Um, they can list you on your resume, their LinkedIn profile. So there are benefits to the volunteer as well. Um, and so a, both sides, both sides of this pro bono equation should approach um, this relationship very professionally um, and from the lens of, are we going to be good partners together? Um, and how is this partnership going to work? What are the communications preferences and the timeline and the expectation setting? Um, and those are all things you can nail down during the interview. And then, of course, during a project kickoff call as well. So thanks so much, Rebecca, for, for calling that out. Um, be choosy with who you select. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So yes, Darlene, I can contact you directly after this event and talk to you about that. Thank you so much for bringing it up. Um, and then I saw a question come in around when is it better to have a volunteer versus a consultant? I think you should revisit the, um, let me see if I can get those slides back up. These four tests for great pro bono, I think this is going to what is what you're going to want to revisit and think through is the urgency test specifically, does this make it a better candidate for bringing in someone who I have a paid signed contract with? They have to deliver this work for me because we, we signed a legally binding contract about it. Um, because if they don't complete it by XYZ date or an XYZ manner, then something bad will happen at my organization that's a good fit. That would be a contractor job or a consultant role, a paid consultant role to bring in or a paid staff position to bring in. So revisit these four tests for, for great pro bono. And I would say use that to be kind of a, a guiding star for you in term if you're considering whether you should bring in a volunteer versus a consultant. Kimberly, uh, if I could add, I, yeah, jump in. I think that that's great advice. And just a reminder that pro bono volunteers are volunteers. And so we have had some people that just couldn't complete their projects. And if you're contracted with someone who works with an organization, you know, if someone has something come up in life, they probably have a colleague who's going to take on that project. But with Taproot, you're usually just working with an individual. So if anything does happen with them, then you're kind of back to square one. That's just something that we've experienced a couple of times. Yeah, so true. Life happens. Life can get in the way. And if you have a, a signed paid contract with someone, they're going to figure out how to still deliver that work for you because they're contractually obligated to. There's no such contract, binding contract, that's going to exist with a Taproot volunteer because they're doing it purely out of the generosity of, um, of their own heart. And so Sometimes if life gets in the way, if a deadly pandemic hits and their family is affected by it, that is absolutely um, has a chance of affecting your project's timeline. So if you cannot be affected negatively in that way, if that project is too critical to your organization's success, 
then that's when you need to bring in someone paid instead of a volunteer. All right, uh, so I think with that, I'm gonna go ahead and close things out. Um, if I didn't address your question, I will dig through the chat log and I'll get back to you one-on-one -on -one through email following the event. Um, I want to say thank you again to Rebecca for joining us and then sticking around for an extra 10 minutes with us. And I also want to say thank you to everybody who made the time to join today. It was so nice getting to know more about you and your organization. Um, I, we appreciate you being part of Taproot's community and uh, we're hoping to work with you soon through Taproot Plus. Thanks all. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.